to have you with us today. It's good to be able to be here. God is good. Uh, we uh, all the time, right? All the time, all the time, all the time. Um, how many has ever taken a car to a mechanic? So recently, yeah. Uh, have you described to him what was going on with it? So you you describe to him, you paint a picture for him what's going on, right? Most of the time, it's not exactly what's going on, but uh, but you paint a picture. So you're trying to make someone see something. Uh, bring me down just a little bit back there. Thank you very much. Uh, that way, if I get too loud, I won't burst the speakers. Um, you try to paint a picture. How many know God's Word is just about painting pictures? Everything from Genesis to Revelation points to the Christ. Everything from Genesis to Revelation point to Jesus. So 4,000 years before He was born, they were painting pictures of Jesus. And so when we look at it in a, in a format like that, we begin to see things that we might not have seen before. So today I want to do that. I want to show you some stuff in Scripture that God has shown me. Um, so turn with me, if you will, just to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. We'll begin with verse 48. Deuteronomy 32. Uh, we'll begin with verse 48. We're going to paint a picture today. Verse 48 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses that selfsame day, saying, Get thee up into the Mount Arabim, unto Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho, and behold the land of Canaan. Look at the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession. And die in the mount, whether thou goest up, and be gathered unto thy people. And Aaron thy brother died in Mount Hor, and was gathered unto his people. Because ye trespass against me among the children of Israel, at the waters of Meribah Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin. Because ye sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel. Ye, yet thou shalt see the land before thee, but thou shalt not go thither unto the land which I give the children of Israel. Brother Scott, will you bless the reading of the word? Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You can be seated. I want to read you verse 51 again, but I'm going to read it in the NIV. The new, uh, some would call that the nearly inspired version. I call it the new international version, but I like the way it reads. It says, this is because God speaking to Moses, this is because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the desert of Zen, and because you did not uphold my holiness, among the Israelites. Now, God is talking to Moses. Now, we know Moses has led God's people for 40 years, right? He has been faithful. We don't find where he made faults or mistakes for 40 years. And now he makes a mistake, and God says to him, that says, uh, Moses, you made a mistake. So you're not going to get to go into the promised land. You sinned, you're not going to get to go into the promised land. And he said to him, and, and we'll get into it in just a second, but he said, you're going to die. I'm going to show it to you, but you're not going to get to go there. Now, if we begin to think about that, what did Moses do wrong? For 40 years, he lived a godly life and he made one mistake, one mistake, and God's going to literally ban him from the promised land? That does not sound fair, right, or true, does it? That sounds wrong. How many in this room think, are thankful that God doesn't hold every mistake against me? I'm thankful He doesn't hold today's mistakes against me. Uh, but this is something I want you to catch right here before we move on. And then, well, let me read the rest of the Scripture, the other Scripture, and then we'll get there. Uh, then we'll go back to this. Numbers chapter 20, I'll read you the story that brought on Deuteronomy 32. Uh, Numbers chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. 
Uh, now then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zen in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses, they griped, they argued, they fussed at Moses, and spake, saying, Would God that we have died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into the wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thy rod and gather the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beast drink. And Moses took the rod from the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch water out of this rock. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I give them. Now there's a point here I want to make, and I want to throw this out. Uh, do you know one of the biggest distractions of the enemy Somebody needs to hear this this morning. This is not my message, but somebody needs to hear this this morning. One of the biggest distractions the enemy will ever use is to tell you it's somebody else's fault. It's somebody else, or it's what happened to me, or it's what went on in my life, or you never know, you don't understand what went on. God said to Moses, it's your fault. You did this. Now Moses could say, well, they were whining, they were complaining, I was frustrated, I got tired. You just don't know how many times I've had to, to go back over and over and over. God said, Moses, you're not going to the promised land and it's your fault. So somebody needs to hear this this morning. I don't know who it is, this is not where we're going to stay, but let me say this to somebody. The moment you stop blaming someone else for your problems and start saying, God, I've been walking in sin, forgive me, is the moment you can start healing from the problem and moving forward. Amen. Amen. Give God praise. God made it very clear to Moses, this is your fault. Now, I go back to this and I think, okay, so what was Moses' sin? Well, let's see, he got angry with the children of God, right? He got angry with them and he was cursing, he was screaming at them. And if you go back to 11, verse 11 of that last scripture, here's what you'll find Moses did. And so many times, if we're not careful, this happens. You ever see those televangelists or those evangelists that are mighty men of God and then all of a sudden they're fallen by the wayside? One of the reasons that happens is people begin to believe they're the one doing the miracle. They're the one that is actually doing the miracle. And what Moses said to the children of Israel was, so you need me to bring water out of the rock. You need me to bring water out of the rock. You can read it for yourself in verse 11 right there. He said, so you want us to bring you water again, or me and Aaron to bring you water again. And so Moses, first of all, claimed what was God to be his self. He was angry with the people, and then he disobeyed God's direct order. God showed up and told him how to do it, and he didn't do it. So yes, there's sin involved, but here's what God actually calls that sin. In verse 12 of Numbers 20, he says this, You don't get to go into the promised land because you didn't believe me. He calls it unbelief. 
So we can break it down any way we want, but it's actually unbelief. When we have fear and anxiety in our life, it's unbelief before God. And when we are struggling with things, and we talked about it last week, not, not everyday things that happen, but the things that are deep-rooted inside of you, the things that hold you up at night, the things that you're meditating on, that God is saying, if you'll trust me with that, I'll solve it. So he says in verse 12, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of God. You believed me not. So, what did he do? He struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to it. Now, God was painting a picture with the rock. How many know what the rock represents? The rock represents Jesus. It represents Christ. And if we understand that, the first time God told Moses to strike the rock and water come forth, it's a picture that he painted of Christ, that he would have to die on the cross of Calvary, but he would only have to die once. He would never need to be struck again. From that point on, once you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, all you have to do is ask and it will be given unto you. You can ask for forgiveness, and it will be given. So Moses really took the picture that Christ, or or that God was painting, and he kind of messed it up. Now God knew that already. How many have messed up God's life, or God's will for your life? And I love this when people say this. We say, well, the devil made me do it, or the devil messed it up. but, But here's reality. Mark Woody screwed up Mark Woody's life. And when I get to heaven and the Bible says he's going to wipe away all the tears, I believe that's going to be because if I make it through those gates, he's going to show me where I could have been and where I ended up because I made choices along the way. And and you know, and I know people say, well, if it's going to happen, it's God's will. God did not make you an alcoholic. God did not make you a drunk. That contradicts God's word. God did not make us those things. That is a choice that we made. That is where God says it's my fault to do those things. Now, let me move on because I'm going to be good. God said you didn't believe me. You didn't trust me. And you didn't do it my way. You did it your way. Moses was denied the promised land. And I'm reading this story, and I'm studying through this, and I'm thinking, here's what God said. Manny, I want you to go with me. You're going to die right up here. You're not going to get what you've been talking about for 40 years. It's not for you anymore. They'll get it, but you won't. But I'm going to kill you right up here on the mountain. Come with me. I don't think I'll go today, God. I think I'll stay right back here, right? (laughs) But yeah, if God told you you're going to die, if you go over there, would you go over there? I don't think so. You're going to be staying right here. But he says that, and I think about Moses, and I'm thinking, 40 years of taking care of Israel, and it ain't been easy. That's one of those congregations that creates trouble. Mark, you ever seen those? No, don't answer that. Mark's pastored for a long time. And there are congregations, and there are people in congregations that just absolutely love to stir trouble. They may not even know they're doing it. But Moses had some of those folks. Well, I wish you'd have just left us back in Egypt. At least we had we had some rhubarb and some strawberries and cucumbers. You just you brought us out here and just nothing's and and let's be real. Everyone in this room can relate to this. The people you help the most are usually the ones that badmouth you the most, right? Everyone in this room can relate to that. We've all been there and done that because the moment you can't is the moment you're evil. And that's what... So Moses, he's praying. God sends manna. They whine because they won't meet. He prays. God sends quail. They're, they, they're getting bit by snakes. He puts a, a, a cross up, if you will, and puts a snake on it, a bronze serpent. And, and every time we turn around, Moses is helping them. And the moment it doesn't go the way they want, it's his fault. They complained, they bickered, they insulted Moses, they called him names, they rejected God's will, and honestly, they were a pain to work with, and yet he diligently took care of them. Diligently. God even said amazing things about Moses. In Numbers 12, 3, he said, There is not a man on this planet that is more meek than Moses. Paraphrasing, but that's what he said. He said, He's the best of the best. He makes one mistake, one mistake, and God says, nope, you can't go in. 
Man, I don't know about you, but that seems off a little bit. That's tough, isn't it? <laughs> One sin and Moses is banned from the promised land. Does it sound fair? But thank God that's not the final chapter of Moses' story. Can somebody thank God this morning your story's not done yet? So here's the picture I want to paint for you this morning. God has been painting pictures of Christ since day one. So how does He paint a picture of Moses if He bans him from the promised land? Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible known as the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He is the author, or at least the best we can tell, the author of the Torah, which is the law of God. The law of God. So Moses literally is represented by the law, or the law is represented by Moses. Now picture this. If God is painting a picture, and I understand some theologians say this differently, but if the picture is for the children of Israel to get to the promised land because they do not have the Christ yet to get them to heaven, therefore the best thing that they can get to is the promised land or rest for God's people. And if we understand that, then here's what God could literally be showing us today. I cannot let Moses in because Moses represents the law. And the law will never, ever, ever get you there. Let me say that clearly again. You will never be good enough to get to heaven. You will never be good enough to get to heaven. If the promised land is a picture or an image or a type and shadow of the, the heaven that we are hoping for, praying for, diligently working for Christ for, if God lets Moses in, then that says you can get in by the law. If he's painting a picture, guess who Moses' successor is? Joshua. Joshua in the Old Testament is Yeshua. It means Savior. So in a bigger picture of Moses' life, while we see Moses and we go, man, that's not fair. God says, hold on. I'm painting a bigger picture here. I'm painting a picture. I'm showing you that you'll never be good enough living by the law to, to get into heaven. Only by the Savior will you be able to get in. I know, I know the pra Yeah, give him praise. That's good. I understand that the promised land is a rest for God's people here. And I understand the concept of that. But if you're painting a picture, and you're showing the promised land, now you're saying, Moses, I'm going to use you for a bigger thing than you ever were. I want to show them that it's going to take a Savior to get them there. I want to show them that they can't work their way to heaven. I want to show them that it's Christ and Christ alone. Who's going to take them in? Joshua, Yeshua, spelt the same, Jesus i got to be good. He paints pictures throughout Scripture. The Passover wasn't about a little lamb. It was about the Christ. It was a picture of the Christ. It wasn't about a little lamb. It was about Christ. John the Baptist, who did they say he was? Elijah, right? Because it was a picture of. It was a picture of. When we go back and we begin to look from Genesis to Malachi, the Old Testament paints pictures for us. He literally was saying, Moses, your story isn't finished yet. While it looks bad for you at this very moment, that's not the point. The point is, I'm going to save the entire world and I'm just painting a picture. You know what God spoke to me about this? God said, what you're going through is all you see right now. And as long as you can't see that I've got a bigger picture going on, you're going to fall apart in the wilderness because, because I've got a bigger picture. And all you can see is the trees. You don't see that there's a whole big forest here. You don't see that I planted that forest so that you would have wood and houses and everything. All you see is that there is a tree in your way. All you see is that there is. And I begin to see this from a whole different light this week. And I'm seeing Moses and I'm going, wait a minute. God had a bigger picture for him.
Crossing the Jordan represents going to heaven. How many remember the old songs, the old hymns? I know you do. You're from Oklahoma. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Jesus died for my sins to atone. When in darkness I see, He'll be waiting for me. I won't have to cross. Some of y'all know that song, even though I butchered it. Yeah, some of y'all know that. I remember them old songs, and I begin to look at this, and I'm going, you know, somebody understood this when they wrote a song like that. They understood that God was painting a bigger picture. Yet all I can see sometimes is what's right in front of me at this very moment. And God this whole time has been painting pictures. What if the mess I'm going through... Now, now, let me get it clear. I didn't say the mess He put you through. I said the mess you put yourself in most of the time. Reality, reality, reality. Uh, but He said, there's a bigger picture that I'm painting. Let me go on. What's the biggest picture of this? Christ is the only way. B.L. Kelly used to tell me, I said, sometimes I struggle with what to preach. B.L. Kelly said, when you don't know what to preach, preach Christ and Him crucified. Preach Christ. Because you can never go wrong preaching Christ, right? So this week as I'm struggling, I start looking to Christ because I don't know which direction to go. And he begins to show me this. And he says, I was pointing them to Christ to let them understand that when the Messiah shows up, the Jewish people would know that the law was simply the mirror that was to show them the way. How many, how many know you look in a mirror when you want your hair fixed? Come on, ladies, right? But the mirror doesn't fix your hair. The mirror only points you. We don't worry about that too much, do we? <laughs> Jeremy posted pictures of me the second week I was here seven years ago. And I'm thinking, dude, I had hair. Gosh. Thank you guys very much for that. That's it. The purpose of the law was a mirror for us to see what we needed and that we need Christ. Galatians 2.16 says, A man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ. James 2.10 says, Whosoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all the law. Romans 3.20 says, No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. Moses was a, had a flawless life and then one mistake, but God was showing us that there's a bigger picture. There's a bigger picture. What's going on in your life right now? It looks bad. It looks bleak. It looks miserable at times. But there's a bigger picture. Maybe the blessing that you're going through right now, God says, I've got something bigger. And sometimes as Pentecostals, we literally get to a point to where we say, you know what? Well, God's going to do this. God's going to do that. God's going to set this free. He's going to bind every demon. He's going to do this. Do you know what? Sometimes God says, actually, I got a bigger picture than what you're going through. I'm going to take my hands off just a little bit. And then we're rebuking and binding what God is really doing. Sometimes I have to realize in my life when it's not where I want it to be, God's got a bigger plan than what I'm seeing in front of me. What are you going through? Let me go on. Matthew 17, 1 through 3, sort of paraphrasing. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up into a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Then, just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Scripture goes on to say this. Moses was the law, the one that brought the law. Elijah was one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. It says they fell down on their knees and they began to worship and they literally said, let us build. Peter said, let me build a tent for Moses, Elijah, and you, Jesus. 
And the voice comes from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. They raise up and guess who's gone? The law and the prophets. They're not there anymore. Only Christ. Only Christ. How did Moses get in? Because this certainly shows that he made it. Through Jesus. He was a righteous man, a good man. I'd love to just preach right here for a few minutes because I believe there's a lot of people in churches today that think they're all right with God. They've got a whole lot of religion and a very little relationship. Not this church, obviously. Your guys are flawless, glitch-free. I know that. But there's a whole lot of people that have been in church and they know what it's all about and they can shout with the best of them and they can run the aisles, but they truly don't have an intimate relationship with God. They've not heard the voice of God call them. They've not listened. They've not received Christ as their Lord and Savior. How do I know that? Because you are heartbroken when you break His God when you truly know Him. You're heartbroken when you break His heart. i got to go. The story goes on. Peter offered up to build tents. God is still painting pictures even in the New Testament. Acts 4.12 says salvation is found in no one else but Christ. Was God unfair to Moses? No. Through choices of my own, I was married at age 19 for 11 years. Got a divorce. Found my way back to God. I know people don't like that because you can't be used of God if you've ever made a mistake, right? Especially that mistake. That's the unpardonable sin. But I could tell you today, 24 years later, the most valuable lesson I ever learned was the mistake I made. I learned more from them from every pastor that I've ever sat under. I learned more of how to be a man than I ever knew. God had a bigger picture in mind than the trouble that I was going through when I laid that 30-30 right there and pulled the trigger and still got a scar from it. God had a bigger picture in mind. And thankfully, He never gave up on this old drunk. And He never gave in. And I'm thinking, if Moses can't make it and God said, you're not seeing the bigger picture, Moses made it. He just didn't get everything that I had for him on earth because he didn't do it my way. He said, but I have so much for you. But you need to understand that there is a bigger picture than what is going on right now in your life. There is a bigger picture for your life. And if anybody can teach me that, it's Moses because I learned by example. And I'm seeing that Moses literally, and I'm thinking how cruel was it that he didn't get to go in, but instead he got to go to the paradise of God. And when Christ went to the grave and returned and rose and went to heaven, Moses got to go with him. And I'm thinking, man, Moses didn't lose. And we go, well, how can God take somebody? How can someone die? Are you serious? Isn't that the win? Isn't that the victory? When we get to heaven, isn't that the goal of this whole thing is to get there? God wasn't unfair. I've just been looking at this story through men's eyes. God really gave Moses one of the greatest gifts of all. The ab ability to point people to Christ. What if anything and everything in my life, whether it's my fault or not, instead of pointing people to the tragedy that I'm going through, what if I can point them to Christ? What if I can point them to my Savior? This morning I want to make two altar calls. First of all, oh wait, I got two more pages of notes, right? I'm done. Closing the book. First of all, this might not be your favorite message, but let me make this clear. 
I want to invite you to know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Not a game. Not something your mama and daddy told you. My mama always told me I was going to be a preacher. You know, my mom never told me that. If she had it, I'd have been upset. Still might be. But I'm talking about knowing Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want to invite you this morning. Whether you have known Him and walked away. Or whether you just need to know Him as your Lord and Savior. Don't leave this world without knowing Christ. Secondly, I want to say this to everyone who does know Christ. And you're going through some ugly stuff right now. Sister, you're going through some ugly stuff. But just know that there's probably a bigger picture. There's probably a bigger picture going on than you can imagine. So if you can just hold on, look to Christ and go, I don't know what we're doing, but I'm going to trust you. Because unbelief's the first one you call out in your realm of sins from Revelation, right? And from Moses, the unbelief is the first one you call out. Because I didn't believe you. So I just want to trust you. Pastor, my marriage is falling apart. I just want to trust you. Pastor, my finances, I just want to trust you, Lord. I don't know if I'll be homeless tomorrow or not, but I want to trust you. I don't know if my heart will explode tomorrow or not, but I want to trust you, God. I want to trust your son Jesus that he died on Calvary for my deliverance, that he took stripes for my healing. I want to trust you. I want to worship you. Blessed I came. Naked I came. Naked I'll leave. But blessed be the name of the Lord. When the enemy steals my worship, you've got a bigger plan. When I mess up so bad that I've missed my promised land, you've got a bigger plan. For some of you that's going through some stuff, you literally just need to come and say, God, help me trust you. Help me trust you. Because you serve a God that literally is painting a lot bigger picture than what we see in front of us at this moment.